All right, Acts chapter 13. Just a quick review as we've been going through this book. Obviously now you should be able to recite this part almost um, off the top of your head. This is the birth of the church. This is what we've been going through. We saw it grow rapidly in Jerusalem. And then we saw it scattered into the surrounding regions because of great persecution. And the gospel at this point now has now reached the Gentiles. And last week, I mean, it's just going to take off from this point. Last week, we saw Herod Agrippa kill James, the brother of John, with the sword. And then he imprisoned Peter, and he intended to do the exact same thing to him that he had done to James. But the church prayed without ceasing for Peter, and Peter was miraculously delivered by an angel. It was a fascinating account. And a short while later, Herod Agrippa died quite violently, and that brought us into what we're going into this coming week. Our theme as we continue to go through the book of Acts comes out of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 16 through 18, which say, Rejoice always, and pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. We closed last week with the simple verse in uh, chapter 12, verse 25. It said, And Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their ministry, and they also took with them John, whose surname was Mark. So launching right in, chapter 13. Now in the church that was at Antioch, there were certain prophets and teachers. Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaen, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. So we have these prophets and teachers at this church in Antioch. Barnabas, Simon, called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manaen, and Saul. And we've talked a whole lot about Barnabas already, haven't we? And this was the son of encouragement. He gave up his inheritance to provide for the church when it was first getting started. And he gave up his birthright as a Levite in the same breath. He forewent his physical provision under the Lord to be a part of the work that God was doing. It was more important to him than having his physical needs secure, to be on board and to follow after what the Lord would do. It's important in that God will always provide Always, when we surrender to his leading and to his work. But this Barnabas was a Cyprian. He was originally from the island of Cyprus, and then he moved to Jerusalem. And God, at this point, has sent him all over the place. And then you have this Simeon, who is called Niger, and this Lucius of Cyrene. And there's a lot here in just a couple of very simple words. Simeon is literally the same name as Simon. It's just an alternate spelling. If you remember, if you turn back real quick to Acts chapter 11, just a couple pages back, verse 19, we get some insight into how this church at Antioch came to be. Verses 19 and 20 in chapter 11 say, Now those who were scattered after the persecution that arose over Stephen traveled as far as Phoenicia and Cyprus and Antioch, preaching the word to no one but the Jews only. But some of them were from Cyprus and Cyrene, who when they had come to Antioch, spoke to the Hellenists, which was the Greeks, preaching the Lord Jesus. So you have this contingent of men who showed up from Cyprus and Cyrene, and they were led to preach the gospel and plant a church in Antioch. So you have the Simeon, or Simon. He was also called Niger. And Niger in the Greek, there's no other way around this, Niger in the Greek means black. It's where we get our word Nigeria. Cyrene was a territory in North Africa, and it bordered right up to what is today the Republic of Niger, just north of Nigeria. And so this man called Niger was a leader in this church that was planted by men from Cyprus and men from Cyrene. And the point in this is it is widely thought that this Simon is Simon of Cyrene. You can make a pretty strong case for it just from the points that are outlined in Scripture. Now, if you don't recall, Simon the Cyrene... We saw him in Luke chapter 23, verse 26, as they were leading Jesus to the cross. And it says, as they led Jesus away, they laid hold of a certain man, Simon, a Cyrenian, who was coming from the country, and on him they laid the cross, that he might bear it after Jesus. We talked about this at the time when we went through Luke. To come from Cyrene to Jerusalem, that was a journey of 800 miles. It's a 40-day journey. You had to really want to be there. And that Simon came from that far away to celebrate Passover. He was a godly man. And he traveled a great distance to fulfill his service to God. 
all of the Gospels mention this account. It's important. This is, a, this is an important thing that happened, but it's also important to know one Gospel and only one Gospel mentions this man's sons, Alexander and Rufus. Which Gospel mentioned those two? It was Mark. In chapter 15, verse 16, who came to Antioch with Barnabas and Saul? Mark. Mark knew this Simon the Cyrene and his sons. And then you have Paul. When he wrote to the Romans, in chapter 16, he sends a greeting to Rufus, one of Simon's sons, chosen in the Lord, and his mother. So Paul, it would appear, knew this Simon the Cyrene and his wife and his sons. It's possible that they taught together here in this church in Antioch. Now about Simon the Cyrene, when the soldiers hauled him out of the crowd, they put a cross on him. This for him would have been an utter humiliation. He was in Jerusalem. He had traveled a very long distance just to perform his service to God. And here he is forced to carry a cross. And outside of the weight and the discomfort of the moment, you have to understand, we talked about this last week, during Passover, the population in Jerusalem swelled. You have upwards of a million people there, and they're all lining the streets, mocking this Jesus. And now they place this cross on Simon. And the thing is, anybody who carried a cross was guilty. It was like saying, I'm, I'm guilty. It was, everybody knew where you were headed. So to have a cross on you was to openly profess you're guilty in the eyes of anybody who's watching you. So he carried a cross for which he would have thought he had no guilt, this Simon. But the thing was, and he came to realize this as he progressed, Jesus was not guilty. There's a truth in Simon carrying that cross for him that I think Simon realized over time. This man, Jesus, was not guilty, but I am. It's right that I carried his cross because it's truly my cross. It's my sin that put him there. In confessing Jesus Christ as our Savior, any one of us, we claim the guilt of his cross. That's a necessary part of the deal. And in Matthew chapter 16, verses 24 through 26, Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. So you have this Simon the Cyrene who was uniquely chosen in the Lord to bear his cross on the way to Calvary. He was the first to fulfill Jesus' words. You must carry your cross. And now you have these men from Cyrene, which was 800 miles away from Jerusalem, and they went all the way up to Antioch to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it does beg the question, how did the gospel get to Cyrene in the first place? And I would offer that it was a changed Simon who took the gospel back home and continued to bear that cross every day. His family was saved, and then you have this Lucius from Cyrene right here who was saved, and eventually they venture up to Antioch, which, if you're curious, is 1,100 miles away from Cyrene. And the Lord starts a church there. Then you have this Menaean. It says he was brought up with Herod the Tetrarch which we know to be Herod Antipas. This is not Wormy from last week. This, this is Herod Antipas who had John the Baptist killed and brought Jesus before him. And he didn't find anything in the charges against Jesus, but he didn't do anything to stop what was about to happen either. And he sent him back to Pilate. And you have this Menaean, who was essentially this Herod's foster brother. And just a quick history context note. Herod was a Roman-installed king over the region of Judea. Herod and Menaean would have had an identical upbringing, raised in the palace of Herod the Great. But Menaean was quite a different man than Herod Antipas. This name Menaean means comforter or leader. And because of his upbringing, because of where he came from, he would have been well-known, very well-known. He brought some prestige and some distinction with him. And here he is, teaching and prophesying in this church in Antioch. And then you have Saul. We've talked much about Saul, the expert in the law, and the persecutor of the church. He was blinded by the light, and now he is redeemed by the Lord. 
So just take a minute to consider the leadership here in this church at Antioch. Just take their names, because that's all we're given. Barnabas, which means son of encouragement. Menaean, which means comforter and consoler. Simon, it's a name that means hearkening or listening intently. Lucius means illuminative. And Saul means prayed for. Think about those names. Look at what the Lord did here. This is what you should expect in your church leadership, even today. Son of encouragement, comforter, consoler, someone who will listen intently, illuminative, which is not to say you want an enlightened thinker, but one who will rely solely on the lamp of God's word to light the way for the body of Christ, and for their families, and for themselves. And prayed for, one who will pray, and one who will lean on prayer, and place the work always in the Lord's hands first. This is a theme we keep coming back to. God wastes no words in scripture, ever. He gives us a quick and tidy lesson in church leadership just by the names of the men who led this church at Antioch. It's a fascinating thing. Aside from that, look at the incredible variety in who God brought forward to lead this church. You have the Cyprian Levite, and the Froster brother of a Roman ruler. You have two men out of North Africa, one whose name straight up was black. And they were 1,100 miles away from home. And then you have this unique man who is of Greek and Roman and Hebrew lineage. This is the Gentile church. This was the blueprint for the whole church moving forward. And we tend to consider scripture in such a bleached out sense. But look at who the Lord lined up here to lead this church in Antioch, to teach this church. He drew them from all over like a magnet. Not one of these men is actually from Antioch. Don't miss that. None of them are from Syria. And none of them are from Jerusalem either. These are not the old guard. God drew these guys specifically to help form what this was going to be. All races, all backgrounds, all social classes. We just went over this during the midweek in Galatians chapter 3, verse 28 through 29. We're told there is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. The thing is, God sets us each in the skin that he sets us in. That's just the way that it is. It has no bearing in how he esteems any one of us. No bearing in how he regards us. He just sees his children. He just loves his children. And there is no place for us to see each other any differently than how he sees us. See also in this, though, each one of these guys gave up something significant to be there doing this work for the Lord, to be of service to the Lord. Barnabas gave up security. He gave up his inheritance and a lifetime of provision from the system of the law. Manaean gave up royalty. He gave up a place in the palace. Saul gave up his political future, a promising career in the temple courts where he would have been respected and regarded and not threatened and stoned. Lucius and Simeon gave up home. They left everything in Cyrene to preach the gospel to these people. They each gave up a substantial piece of who they were. That is the Christian walk. Surrendering who you are to the purpose of who God wants you to be. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. The final point within just this one verse, and then it's going to pick up pretty quickly from here, I promise. (laughs) Look again at who the Lord brought forward. He had Barnabas, who was of the people of the priests and the ministers. He was of the tribe of the Levites, and he left it behind. But he knew something about priests and ministers. Then he had one who left behind the throne room, who knew something about what it was to be royalty and to leave it behind to be of service to the Lord. He had two who came up out of northern Africa. Don't miss this. That's the exact place God brought his children up out of when he delivered them out of Egypt. It's where Jesus grew up as a child, and he came up out of Egypt. God brought these two from up out of that region. 
they knew something about the plight Jesus had. They knew something about the plight the children of Israel's had. And he brought one up out of the law into God's grace in Saul. Five men who could speak uniquely to the different facets of who Jesus Christ is. Look at what he did there. It's an incredible thing. In verse 2, though, as they ministered to the Lord and fasted, and I just want you to hang up there on that one phrase, as they ministered to the Lord. And church is not about what we get. I hope you understand that. It's not about what we receive or how many programs we can offer. It's about service to the Lord. The question should never be, what can you offer me? It has to be, what can I offer to God? And I'm not talking about money at all. Please understand that. I'm not even talking about physical actions. I'm talking about our intention in coming before Jesus every single week. It has to be, I will honor the Lord today by meeting with his body. I will worship the Lord today. I will sing praises to him because he is worthy. I will minister to him in that. I will fellowship with his people. I will pray with his people. I will receive the word he brings forth to me, not because of the good feelings it gives me, not because of what it does in my life or the knowledge that it gives me, because I know he will use that word in somebody else's life for the good of somebody else. And he is giving me that seed right now because it's going to grow into something that's going to help somebody else down the road. I will offer everything I am to be of service to the Lord today, to minister to the Lord. That has to be our focus. And within that, he blesses us. Please don't miss that. When we serve him, he blesses us. We receive immense blessing just by presenting ourselves before him as living sacrifices. And the words that you say and the prayers that you offer to each other on behalf of each other, even just the simple kindnesses you exhibit, you show each other kindness. All of these things minister to the Lord. And the Lord uses them to minister to others. And that's the way it should be. Serving God is not about what you do for the people. Please understand that. It is about what you give to him. And then he ministers to others through that effort. Bless the Lord's heart through what you do today. That is my encouragement to you this morning. Seek to bless his heart. The same as you would for anybody that you love. And realize within that you are seeking to bless the heart of the living God. That is sacred ground when you minister to him. Bless the Lord's heart in what you do, and he will bless you, period. He will bless many more on top of that. Within that also, in ministering to the Lord, this is why it's so important when God is our focus, when he's the recipient of our ministries, it takes all of the burden of so-called success off of us. When you minister to people, you begin attempting to please people, going bigger and better and more holy than before. And the thing about people is they may flat out not accept the message. That's just part of it. They may not accept the word of encouragement. They may not accept whatever you do in Jesus' name. And when our focus is in ministering to the people, in those moments when we're not accepted, we feel rejected. We feel that we failed or that we've been unsuccessful. But Jesus said in Luke chapter 10, verse 16, He who hears you, hears me. He who rejects you, rejects me. And he who rejects me, rejects the one who sent me. Minister to the Lord. He will never reject that, ever. And he will use it, always. The Holy Spirit said, Now separate to me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then having fasted and prayed and laid hands on them, they sent them away. So you have this church here full of the Spirit with these dedicated teachers and prophets. And as they fasted and ministered to the Lord, they received this word of prophecy from the Holy Spirit. And what's interesting here is the Holy Spirit did not say there's a need among the Gentiles. Who's in? (laughs) Didn't try to drum up interest in the need or cajole an effort out of the people or force a response out of responsibility or emotion, the Holy Spirit specifically separated two men by name 
two who had already had this personally confirmed to themselves, don't lose that in this, separate Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. And now it is confirmed to the rest of the group. Something that you will see repeatedly through scripture is God will issue a call, and then that call will be confirmed. If there's a work, but you're having to boost support for that work, you are creating obligation instead of allowing the Lord to provide for the need. And on the other hand of that, if you feel obligated to a work, do yourself a favor and get out. I say that with as much love as I can. Do not do it if you're obligated to it, because you will just become embittered by it. It's just a natural progression, and that is not fun when that happens for anybody. Ministry and service to the Lord is a get-to. It's not a have-to. Do what the Lord gives you to do. Be involved in that business. He will make his calling on your life clear. I encourage you this morning, answer God's call, not man's. God's calls are a joy. Man's calls will be a burden, always. But see in this, Saul here has been a believer at this point for 12 to 14 years. For all of his knowledge of the law, he has had this prolonged time of preparation now. And the Spirit makes it clear, now's the time. I'm putting you on the move. Minister to the Lord to the rest of the known world. And so there they go. Verse 4, so being sent out by the Holy Spirit, they went down to Seleucia, and from there they sailed to Cyprus. And when they arrived in Salamis, they preached the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews. They also had John, John Mark, as their assistant. So remember, Cyprus, this is where Barnabas is from, where they're landing now. They land on the eastern coast of the island at Salamis. And they preach the word of God in the synagogues of the Jews there. And this will be their practice moving forward. They will take the word to the Jews first, then they will take it to the Gentiles. And generally speaking, it's the Gentiles who are receiving of it. And John Mark here, this is an important note, and it's one that we read past most of the time. John Mark goes with them as their assistant. And at this point, he is likely in his early 20s. Scripture gives us a fascinating trail of his walk with the Lord. Remember last week, when we talked about how Peter ran to this prayer meeting when he was freed from prison. He came to this meeting that was at the home of John Mark's mother. And there's a camp out there, and they have some good points. They believe that his mother's house was actually where the upper room was located. Given the space and the distinction, it would have been where the Last Supper was set, and where the Spirit was poured out at Pentecost. It took on a special significance. If you're of that camp, you can make a case for it. But Mark himself, when he wrote his gospel, he gave an account in chapter 14 of Mark of a certain young man who followed after Jesus when he was taken captive in the garden. But the guards grabbed hold of him and he fled and in fleeing, they tore his cloak from him and he ran away naked. And it's thought that Mark was likely referring to himself there. And that perhaps Judas brought the mob first to the upper room, to his mother's house. And hearing the commotion, he followed them to the garden of Gethsemane. And at that point, he would have only been about 12 years old. Basically my son's age. <laughs> it was a landmark moment in his life. A humiliating moment, but a landmark moment. He's grown up with the early church, and some of his earliest steps of faith were following Jesus as he was apprehended in the garden. If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Mark understood that. He was there when almost nobody else was following after Jesus. He saw Jesus on his way to the cross, and he followed. And then he fled in terror. He was just a 12-year-old kid. And then last week, he saw Peter sentenced to death, but miraculously delivered from prison. Whoever loses his life for me will find it. Mark understood that, too. He saw that happen, too. And he traveled with Saul and Barnabas to Antioch, and now he is heading out in ministry on this mission trip. And in verse 6 it says, Now when they had gone through the island to Paphos, and what you need to understand there, Paphos is on the western coast of Cyprus, so they had to go all the way across the island from where they had landed. It's a distance of about 120 miles. And if you're just walking straight through, which they were not, that's a, at least a five-day journey to get across this island. And Cyprus is rocky terrain. It's not a simple walk. They have two mountain ranges in the middle 
And they're nothing like our mountains, but they're still mountains. <laughs> and these men are stopping and preaching the word of God as they go. And they eventually get to Paphos. And it says they found a certain sorcerer, a false prophet, a Jew whose name was Bar-Jesus. This is a very righteous sounding name, translated literally, it is son of Jesus. In verse 7 it says, this Bar-Jesus was with the proconsul Sergius Paulus, an intelligent man. This man called for Barnabas and Saul and sought to hear the word of God. But Elimus, the sorcerer, for so his name is translated, withstood them. So his proconsul, Sergius Paulus, was the governor of the entire island of, of Cyprus. And he hears of these men who are causing quite a stir as they come through and make their way across this particular region. And he calls them. He wants to hear this word of God that they're preaching. And then you have this Elimus, who's Bar-Jesus, just a different name for him. And this name, Elimus, is, is a curiosity. It does not seem to have a direct Greek or Hebrew or even Roman translation to it. Roughly speaking, this comes across almost as a satirical translation from Luke. It works out to, if only he could save. This man's name speaks of Jesus, but it has none of his redemptive power. And he withstands Saul and Barnabas as they're brought before this proconsul. He tries to be a block between this man and a real saving faith and the one who can save. He withstood them, seeking to turn the proconsul away from the faith. Then Saul, who was also called Paul, filled with the Holy Spirit, looked intently at him. And Saul, from this point on in Scripture, is going to be called Paul. This is where that moment happens. He'll take on his Roman name as he fully embarks on his ministry to the Gentiles because this could be more relatable to his audience. Remember what we just said. Saul means prayed for. Paul, though means small. Again, just indicative of what this walk with Jesus Christ is. We are always becoming smaller. And he is always becoming greater the further that we walk with him. Our pursuits and our interests give way to his as we walk with him. And our appetite for self shrinks. Our desire to serve grows. We must become smaller. And God must always be growing in each one of our lives. And if he's not, we're walking in the wrong direction, flat out. In verse 7, Paul said, or I'm sorry, verse 10, Paul said, O full of all deceit and all fraud, you son of the devil, you enemy of all righteousness, will you not cease perverting the straight ways of the Lord? So this bar Jesus, the son of Jesus, Paul calls him rightly the son of the devil, enemy of all righteousness. And Paul looks at this man who has the right look and the right sound. His name speaks of Jesus, but his life does not. And Paul calls him out for who he is. In verse 11, it says, And now indeed the hand of the Lord is upon you, and you shall be blind, not seeing the sun for a time. And immediately a dark mist fell on him, and he went around seeking someone to lead him by the hand. Then the proconsul believed when he saw what had been done being astonished at the teaching of the Lord. So the Lord struck Bar-Jesus with this temporary blindness for a time. And the same as Paul had been stricken. Do not lose this. The same as Paul had been stricken when he confronted Jesus on the road to Damascus. And Paul effectively is saying to him here, Lord, reckon with this man the same way you reckoned with me. Perhaps he might still be saved. Take away his sight so that he might see. But notice the distinct differences in the way these things play out. Paul also withstood the Christians. There's no denying that. But as he went to oppose them and to imprison them, he was surrounded by a bright and shining light. Bar-Jesus here has a dark mist fall on him. And Paul immediately repented, immediately declared Jesus as the Lord, immediately obeyed his direction. He had been doing the best he knew how to do to honor God but when he realized his error, and he realized it in a big way, he fell to the ground and he repented. And this Bar-Jesus, though, and we don't get the same reaction from him in this same moment of reckoning. And Luke is sure here to record the reaction and the co conversion of the proconsul, but he says nothing of the false prophet. Where Saul was mistaken in his pursuits, he was earnestly pursuing the living God, and God was sure to correct him. 
This bar Jesus, though, was openly deceptive. He was communing with demonic powers. He was a sorcerer. And there was no similar response to what Paul had experienced and what happened here. God sent Ananias to restore Paul's sight after his repentance. But here, God doesn't seem to send anybody to restore bar Jesus' sight. No repentance. That's the difference. How do you respond to the claims of Christ? Repentance gives you freedom, salvation, and sight. And denying those claims gives you the exact opposite. You continue to walk in darkness and in blindness. But you have the Sergius Paulus here, who was governor over the whole island. It's the first ruler that Paul has brought in front of. It certainly will not be the last. But this man is astonished, not by the miracle that he sees performed in front of him, not by the blindness that's stricken by his, apparently his friend. Read this. He's astonished at the teaching of the Lord. The teaching of the Lord. We see a miraculous conversion here. One who sought to withstand the word of God, and he was blinded by it. And then one who sought to hear the word of God, and he saw the truth in it. It's a fascinating encounter. And this man believed. In verse 13, Now when Paul and his party set sail from Paphos, they came to Perga in Pamphylia. And John, departing from them, returned to Jerusalem. So this particular leg of the journey was about another 200 miles by boat. And at that point, for whatever reason, John Mark departs from them. And there's a lot of speculation as to what might have happened. Everyone has their own scenario. One of them might even be true. <laughs> what we do know is that John Mark did return to Jerusalem. And it's implied that this was very contentious when this happened. In a couple of chapters here in Acts 15, we're going to see Barnabas wants to bring Mark along again on their next trip. And Paul and Barnabas have some sharp words over it. They have a falling out, and they, they go different directions. But the other thing that we know in this is that whatever happened here in this moment, they managed to get past it eventually. And grace covers over whatever it is that happened here. Because about 14 to 16 years from this point, Paul, as he's closing out the book of 2 Timothy, will write and ask that Mark be sent to him because of his usefulness in ministry. And then when Paul writes to the Colossians, he writes of Mark being with him. It says Mark sends his greetings. Mark would go on and spend a great deal of time with Peter. And we've talked about this. Peter was likely one of the major sources for Mark's gospel. And later Mark goes into Egypt. Same direction. Note this. Mark goes where Lucius and Simon came from. Same region. He evangelizes there, and he pastors a church in Alexandria. There's a huge encouragement in this that I want you to walk away from here with. Dwell with each other in grace and be patient with each other, especially when it comes to somebody who is simply younger in the faith than you are, because we will get on each other's nerves. We're going to say the wrong thing, and we're going to do the wrong thing, or both. That's going to happen as we walk this walk as believers in Christ. But we have to reach back to that point of grace and meet there. We do not have the luxury in Christ's kingdom of writing anybody off, ever. Even in the worst situations, there may still be healing there. There may be something beautiful God is waiting to do. And God eventually heals this fracture between Paul and Mark. He can heal the fractured relationships in your life. But it takes a point of humility and turning back to that point of grace. It simply cannot happen in our own efforts. We can't make it better. We can't heal what's been scarred and wounded on our own. It only ever happens truly under God's grace. It would appear that Mark stumbles here. But God will restore this relationship. And he will use Mark greatly down the road. Allow him to do the same thing in your life. Relationally, personally. If you've been running from him for a long time, today is the day. I'm telling you, turn around. Grab hold of your Father in heaven and repent. He's already waiting for you with open arms. That's what we've got for this morning. We're going to pray, close in a song. When we're done, if you're interested in being part of the prayer meeting, we'll be right outside. We're going to get going right off the bat, so get out there. We'll get, we'll get it done and, and head on into the baptism this afternoon. And Father God, um, 
We're grateful for who you are, and we're grateful for the examples that you've left us. Lord, that there can be separation between brothers, that you, you bring a full healing too. Lord, that you give us strength to venture out into places where we don't know what's going to happen. We don't know what's going to come next. And Lord, you carry us through those things. And I just ask that you be putting it on each of our hearts to trust in you, to hear your call, Lord, and to follow your call, just to be about the work that you have for each one of us to do because you have gifted each one of us individually and uniquely. Each one of our experiences, Lord, you gave those to us so that we can speak of who you are and who you've been in our lives. We just ask this week that you would bring people to us, bring people across our paths who are in desperate need of hope, in need of hearing from you. Lord, we want to be there and represent you rightly. We want to minister to you in those moments. And um, we just give that the whole week into your hands. We ask for your protection and your healing, and just for your guidance and what happens, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together.